So today we're going to start a new series. Uh, we're going to be back into the New Testament. And before we get in there, I just want to say thank you to Rigo for filling in today. Rigo, uh, always great to have Rigo fill in for us as uh, pa- uh, um, David Payton and his family are all out of town enjoying one last little vacation before school starts. So uh, it's great, uh, wonderful music, wonderful songs to lift us up, prepare us, our, our hearts, so we can hear God's Word. We're going to be in the parables where this new series is, we're, we're looking at the parables that are found only in the Gospel of Luke. And maybe at the end, then we'll look at a few other gospel, uh, parables that are found in some of the other gospels as well. But I want to focus on, for the next several weeks, parables found in the gospel of Luke. And as we get into this series today, I, I want to take a few moments, and, and a lot of this is not in your outline for those of you who like the, to follow outlines, but a few years ago, about six or seven years ago, I preached a series on the parables in, found in the uh, gospel of Matthew chapter 13. There are several parables there, and we looked at that, and in the very beginning of that series, I did a message that kind of helped us introduce the whole idea of how do we look at parables. And so I want to just give a few thoughts on that as we get into this series uh, so that we'll understand when Jesus preaches in parables how we look at that, all right? Um, So understanding parables, you know, here's what's interesting. Even the disciples one day, they said, Jesus, why do you preach in parables? They didn't quite get it, you know. To understand that that one-third, right at one-third of Jesus' preaching and teaching is, is in parables. That's a lot. And Jesus did that on purpose, and we'll we'll begin to see that as we look at these parables. So what is a parable? Well, a a parable, the the word means to place beside or alongside of something else. In other words, uh, placing something to compare to something else. Jesus did it like this. He put one story to compare it to another story. Uh, Did you get that? It's a comparison. That's a parable. Uh, Jesus usually used life circumstances. A lot of times he would use nature But he's trying to teach a spiritual lesson with a story. So uh, let me just give you kind of a definition of it. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. As we look at parables, I want you to think about that. It's an earthly story. When I first wrote this down, I put an earthy story. I left the L out. And and then I started thinking about it. You know, a lot of them are kind of earthy, to be honest with you, because they are about nature, you know. But earthly story with a heavenly meaning. What, why would Jesus preach and teach in parables? What is the purpose of a parable? Well, he kind of has two ideas. And again, this really comes out in Matthew 13, but I want to bring it out for just a second this morning. One of the things that Jesus does, one of the reasons he preaches in parables is he wants to conceal the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. Now, I know that sounds kind of odd that Jesus would want to conceal something, but the reality is he does. Because of the hardness of the heart of the people, sometimes he wants to conceal the truths from them. You see, Jesus, and we'll see this today, he's at his popular time in his ministry right now. Uh, The people are following him. He's preaching. He's teaching. He's healing. He's doing all kinds of things. And there were a lot of people in that day and time that were thrill seekers, They just kind of were on a high with Jesus. I want to see what he does today. They didn't really care about what he was teaching. They didn't really care that he was saying, I am the Messiah, the Son of the living God. They didn't really care that he was going to eventually die for their sins. They were just wanting to kind of follow him because they were curious. And so to those types of people, Jesus was concealing the truths of the kingdom of heaven. And yet at the same time, his earthly stories had heavenly meanings. And in the heavenly meanings, he was revealing the secrets of the kingdom of heaven to those who wanted to know. To those who were really wanting to understand who Jesus was, to those who really wanted to understand what this earthly story meant, that was the heavenly meaning side of it. Some people, they would hear the earthly story and they were like, ah, I don't get it, and they just walk away. And then Jesus would many times take them aside and say, well, here's the heavenly meaning of that earthly story. So we need to understand that Jesus did this to reveal and to conceal the truth of the Word of God. And then a couple of things before we get into today's uh, parable. Some of the things we need to understand as we look at and understand and interpret parables. First of all, two things to, to avoid, two extremes to avoid. Sometimes we, we look at it and we look at a parable and we say, there's a spiritual truth in every single detail of the parable. 
And sometimes when people do this, oh, every single word has a meaning, a double meaning, if you will. Be careful with that. Be careful of trying to find hidden meanings in every little syllable and word in the Word of God because it's not there, and it's going to lead you astray, and it's going to mess you up, okay? So don't, don't go into every little detail and try to find some hidden meaning. So there's an extreme to avoid. Here's another one. Don't say that there's only one spiritual truth in each parable. Sometimes we limit God. God is not limited by our understanding. God is all-knowing, all-powerful, omniscient, all of that, and we cannot limit Him. So be careful. Sometimes we, we want to say, oh, there's only one meaning, there's only one truth, that's it, we can't say anything else. We're going to see in a few weeks the parable of the lost son, we call the prodigal son. Man, there's so much truth in that parable. There's a lot in the parable today, even though it's a short one. And then some guidelines to follow as we look at parables Anytime you read a parable, listen to the Lord's explanations. Don't go off on your own tangent without listening to what Jesus himself said about the parable. Now, that's a given and that's an obvious one, but so many times we do that. Well, it sounds like he's saying this. Well, what did Jesus say? Look at what he says first. And then look for the central truth that's in the parable. And we'll see that like today, there's several things going in the parable. Look for the context of the parable. Read the whole parable, read the whole chapter, read the whole book if you have to, but make sure you look at the context of the parable that Jesus is telling because it's always very important to have that. And then one last one, and then we'll get into the parable. Don't use parables to formulate doctrine. Parables are not to formulate doctrine. Today we're going to be talking about forgiveness Now, the doctrine of forgiveness is in the Bible, in the New Testament. It's all there. But don't use this parable to kind of formulate that doctrine. This parable adds to the doctrine of forgiveness. All right? Just some thoughts. We're going to probably look at some of these again uh, just to remind you as we look at parables how we need to look at them and what we need to be careful for. Today, the title of the message is The Two Debtors. Now, I've got to tell you, that's kind of the weakest title I've ever known. I tried all week, you can ask Diana, I tried all week to come up with a title that was better than the two debtors, because that's what it's called in the Bible, it's got most preachers when they preach on this, they call it the two debtors, but it just doesn't tell you anything. Well, I couldn't come up with anything better. So the title is the two debtors. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it, Victor. (laughs) I needed that. This small parable, here's what I love about this. It's only two, three verses long, and yet there's so much in there. We're only going to look at some of it today. There's so much in there. The themes of forgiveness, of mercy, of love, of gentleness and kindness, all these things are in this parable. So let me go ahead and read the passage, beginning with verse 36. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from the city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt down behind Jesus at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee, who invited him, Jesus, saw this, he he said to himself, that's key, listen, he said to himself, so he's thinking, If this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She is a sinner. Then Jesus answered Simon's thoughts and said, Simon, I I have something to say to you. And Simon replied, go ahead, teacher. Then Jesus told him this story, and here's the parable. A man loaned money to two people. 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other. But neither of them could repay him. So he kindly or generously forgave both of them, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose, Jesus turns to Simon, who do you suppose loved him more after that point? And Simon answered, oh, I would suppose the one he canceled the larger debt. And Jesus said, that's right. Then he turned to the woman and yet he said to Simon, Look at this woman kneeling here. 
When I entered your home, you didn't even offer me water to wash the dust off my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the very time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. And then he says, I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown much, me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. And then I love this. This is the only time Jesus speaks to her. Listen to what he says. Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The men at the table, they begin to look at each other. Who is this man that can go around forgiving sins? And Jesus did, ignored them. That's my added point there. He ignored them and he continues to say to the woman, your faith has saved you Go in peace. Let's look at this parable today. Let's look at this, the whole thing that's going on. You have to start with the the context. So the context is a party, okay? There's a party going on. Jesus has been invited by Simon to a party. It's a house party, a dinner party, and people still put dinner parties on today, right? People love to do that. And in that day and time, the dinner party wasn't just for those who were the guests, because of the way the houses were designed, the, the way the houses were designed, there's usually a, a semi-open room or a semi-private, if you will, room, and that's where they would dine. And in this room, they would have tables, small tables in front, but they wouldn't sit at a table like we sit at a table. They would recline, that's why you see that in the Bible, they would recline kind of half, like, here's the way to look at it. Remember the pictures you always see of Cleopatra reclining? That's really what it looked like, okay? Their head towards the table where they could reach out and grab things, but their feet are back here. And that's why the woman could come to his feet. And the other thing we need to understand is in this room, even though they were invited guests, there were others always around. It was always a public event. There would usually be a small wall that would divide the room from their outside street or wherever else. And people would come and lean on the wall or sit on the wall. And sometimes they would even come through the little gate and they would sit along the outer wall there. And they would wait for the scraps and the leftovers because most of these people were poor and they didn't have much. And they would eat what was left over. That's the kind of scene we need to understand that's going on. And not only that, but they would want to hear the conversation. And especially because Jesus is coming along and he's been causing all kinds of commotion. I mean, he's teaching and preaching and he's healing people and he's performing miracles and people are following him and they're thinking, man, I want to hear what this guy has. I want to hear what Simon and Jesus talk about. And so there's a party going on and this woman enters into that party. Well, because she would have been in the crowd. Now, she does break protocol when she begins to touch Jesus. But there's the party. So let's look at the people at the party real quick. There's Simon. It's his party. It's his house. Simon is a Pharisee. Simon is rich. Simon is wealthy. He is educated. He's privileged. The thing we don't know is, is Simon a good Pharisee or a bad Pharisee? We think, oh, he's a Pharisee. Well, then that means he's a good man. He's a moral man. He's a law-abiding man. Did you know that there were some Pharisees in that day and time that were Pharisees, but they really didn't follow the law very well? They were half-hearted in their Pharisee living. And so we don't know where he was at. We don't know if he was one of these on the fringes or if he was truly following the religious laws. Was he curious about Jesus? Is that why he invited Jesus? Was he wanting to hear? Did he really think Jesus might be the Messiah? Or was he one of these thrill seekers that just wanted to know more about this man who's healing and teaching and preaching? We don't know. Or could he already be really mad at Jesus? Could he be one of these that are saying, man, I don't like what Jesus is saying. This guy, Jesus, is saying things that they don't jive with us as Pharisees, and I'm already wanting to find a way to trap him so we can get rid of him. We're not sure what's going on. But nonetheless, there's Simon. He hits his house, his party, and people have been invited, and Jesus has been invited. So who's, who else do we see at this party? We see Jesus, the Son of God, teaching and preaching and healing By the way, this is early on in his ministry. He's maybe even still in the very first year of his ministry. And that's why people are flocking to him. They they see what he's saying and and what he's doing, and they, they want more of it. And remember, at one point, they end up wanting to make him king, right? 
And, and so they're coming after to hear Jesus. And at this party, they still want to hear what Jesus has to say. And then there's one other person we're told about. And she's a prostitute. Now, all we're told in the Bible is that she was a woman of the city who was a sinner. But the reality is that probably means in our terminology today that she was a prostitute. Those are the people that are at the party. But there's not just people at the party, there's a few problems at the party as well. The first problem we see is Simon. Really, Simon? You invited Jesus to your house and you didn't even follow the protocol, the normal protocol to, to give him water to wash his feet, to kiss him, the greet of welcome, and then to anoint his head with oil. None of these things. Simon didn't do any of that. There's a big problem here. Why is he treating Jesus in such a rude, cold manner? We're really never told, but that's a first problem. And by the way, people would have noticed that, okay? It, this would not have gone unnoticed, and it wasn't just that Jesus brought it up, and then people think, oh, oh, yeah, they didn't do that. No, people would have noticed this because this was a standard, normal treatment of an invited guest into your home, and Simon doesn't do any of that. There's another problem. A worldly woman comes into the party. A prostitute comes into the scene and begins to make a scene. She kind of walks up behind Jesus and she wants to anoint his feet with oil. And yet she is so burdened by her sins. She is so caught up with her own sinfulness that she begins to cry. And as she's crying, her tears are falling on Jesus' feet. And she doesn't know what to do. And so she lets down her hair and begins to wipe his feet with her hair. I want you to understand something about that. We read that and we think, well, that's the logical thing to do. That's the first thing. That was taboo in that society. In that day and time... No woman would ever let her hair down except for in the bedroom with her husband. This was seen as something that could have been potentially erotic. That was really not the way she meant it. She was feeling her own sin and she didn't have any towels. She didn't know what to do. But you need to understand as Simon looks at that, that's what he begins to think. Women in that century did not even touch men. And here she's kissing his feet. She did this, why? Because of her own sinfulness. And then you begin to see another problem. Simon is watching this. And Simon, in his own pride and in his own arrogance and his own self-righteousness, begins to think, wow. And he thinks two horrible things, doesn't he? He thinks one horrible thing about the woman. And then he begins to say, man, if, if this guy Jesus was really a prophet... He would know what kind of woman's touching her, touching him, and he would not allow that. And so we begin to see Simon's reaction is another one of those problems at the party. And, and then Jesus, all-knowing Jesus, he knows the thoughts of Simon, and he addresses him. And, and this is where we get to the parable, the, the story, the parable. Jesus knows his thoughts, so he says, Simon, I've got a story to tell you. I, I want to tell you something, and I want you to listen closely. So he tells a very simple story, two or three verses long. He says, man, there's these two people that owe this one guy money. And let's put this in today's terminology. Basically, one denarii was a day's wages for a, way, a, a laborer. So if we were to consider that $11 an hour is a minimum wage, eight hours a day, times 500 days, that's $44,000. That's a lot of money, right? For the, for the other person, it's $4,400, $11 a day of 50 days, or $11 an hour, 50 days. You, some of you have already done the math. Kurt, you probably already done the math and check, make sure I'm right. I'm on? Okay, good. <laughs> you engineers, you. <laughs> but here's the thing. It didn't really matter because neither one of them had money to repay, right? Neither one of them could come up with 44000 or 4400 Nice, simple story. And then Jesus turns to Simon and asks the million-dollar question. Who loves the lender more? Simon, Simon's like, okay, this is too easy to be true, right? Have you ever had one of those tests? 
where the answer's too easy and you're thinking, no, it can't be that because it's too easy. And so he listened to what he says, I suppose, he's not fully going with it. I suppose it's the one who had the larger debt canceled. And Jesus said, yeah, that's right. That's right. So what does this really mean to us? Because I think it doesn't really mean what, first of all, we think it means. You see, you need to come back to Simon's eyes. Simon's eyes, the prostitute was the one with the large debt. And in comparison, his debt was nothing, right? He looks at that woman and he even calls her a sinner. And he looks at his life and he says, ah, my debt's nothing. And he says, okay, so the one that's going to love is the one that forgives most. But here's the point we need to really look at. If you can't pay the debt, it doesn't matter how much you owe. Listen to that again. If you're broke, you're broke, right? If you owe 5000 or 50000 if you don't have it, it doesn't really matter. There's no difference in owing little or a lot if you don't have the money. The truth begins to slowly slip into his life, I believe. Simon begins to understand. And here's what we need to understand. The gospel message is that forgiveness is free for everyone. Man, you guys missed that, didn't you? Is that not the gospel message that we preach today? It doesn't matter whether you owe a lot or a little, or you may think you owe nothing. The gospel message is free for all. The debt, no matter how large or how small you may think you owe, it doesn't matter. We can't pay it back. We don't have a penny to our name. And therefore, the gospel is free for all of us. What Jesus is saying here is, is basically he's saying, Simon, you think you're better than this prostitute. In your own self-righteousness and in your own pride and arrogance, you think you're better. But remember, you kept me at arm's length. You didn't even provide the common courtesy of the day. You didn't show anything. And all she's done is lavished me with her tears and with, uh, with perfume. Simon, you know religion. You know t the temple. You know the sacrifices. You know the law in and out. She doesn't know any of that. But Simon, you missed the point. And she got it. Forgiveness is free for everyone. The debt has been canceled. Jesus has paid it on the cross, I mean, right? You see, Simon thinks he's better than the woman. He says, hey, she's a sinner. And Jesus is saying, no, she's not a sinner. She is a, was a sinner because I've saved her. I've died for her. I'm going to die for her. Simon, in his arrogance, thinks he's better and many times in our own arrogance, we think we're better. But it doesn't matter, any and all of us sitting in this room today, we're all debtors. And the only thing we can do is say, thank you, Jesus, for your forgiveness. By the way, another one, I didn't put this in your outline, but if you want to add another one here. Forgiveness is costly. It costs this man about $50,000 in today's standard. That's what he, he wrote it off. And Jesus, when he died on the cross, it was costly, was it not? And yet, in, on the cross, he says one word that I love, and I'll always remember the word tetelestai, which is Greek for saying paid in full. And what he's saying is he paid our sin debt in full. It was costly, but it's free for all. So let's wrap this up with the pardon, with the application, if you will. Jesus turns and talks to Simon, and I love that, that interaction there with Simon. And he, he says, man, you, you've blown it. You didn't even show me common courtesy. But I love when he turns to the woman and speaks to the woman. And he says three things to her. He says, first, your sins are forgiven. That takes care of her past. Second, he says, your faith has saved you. That takes care of her present. And then he says, Go in peace. That takes care of her future. Did you notice that Jesus didn't ever say here, oh, don't go do what you were doing before? He doesn't condemn her, doesn't condone her. He says, I've forgiven you. Live a life of forgiveness.
That's what he's saying to her. That's what we need to understand for us as well. He wants us to live a life of forgiveness. So for us, here's the first thing. We are all debtors in need of the mercy of God. We are all in the same boat, people, are we? We need his mercy. You see, Simon basically had the attitude, oh, I don't owe Jesus anything, and therefore he risked nothing. The woman, her attitude was, I owe him everything, so she risked everything. But if you look at it, the woman, Simon, all the people at the party, and all of us today are debtors in need of God's great mercy. we got to start with that. I'm not better than anyone in this room. You're not better than anyone in this room either. We're all sinners in need of His mercy. Here's the second one. Our loving and merciful God offers us forgiveness. Our loving and merciful God gives us forgiveness. I love the way Jesus interacts with the woman. He is gentle. He is tenderhearted. He forgives her. He he doesn't yell at her. He doesn't doesn't say, hey, you've been messing up so bad. You are such a great sinner, but I'm going to forgive you anyway. He doesn't have that attitude. It's gentle, loving, merciful. But then look at the way he treats Simon as well. He does get on to Simon, (laughs) the one who thinks he didn't have very much sin. He gets on to him, but he still does it in a gentle, loving manner. He's gentle. He's loving. He's merciful to all of us. And we all need it, don't we? We all need that gentle, loving mercy, that forgiveness he gives to us. And here's the final one. Forgiveness results in a thankful, loving life. I I would share with you today that if you are saved by the grace of Jesus Christ, if you have placed your faith in Jesus and He is your Savior and your Lord, then you are called to live a thankful, loving life that would bring glory to God, glory to His name. It's a life of gratitude. How greatly we have been uh, forgiven. How greatly we need His forgiveness. And if you have really been forgiven, you know it. And you'll live that thankful life. So I ask you this question. How is your love and your gratitude toward Jesus Christ? Because He's the one that forgave you. If you sit here today and you've been forgiven by him, he's forgiven you, then then how is your love? How is your gratitude? How is the attitude of your life? In a world that needs to see love, mercy, and forgiveness, God says, I want you to show that to the world. How are you doing with that? Does the world see Jesus in your life today? Will you bow with me as we pray? Lord, once again, we are so very, very thankful for your holy word. We are so thankful, Lord, for what it teaches us today and every single day. Lord, my first part of my prayer this morning will be for anyone in this room who's never received you in a relationship, that today they would do that, even in the quietness of this moment. They would reach out to you that you would become their Savior and their Lord. They they would accept that free forgiveness that cost you so much. And then, Lord, I pray for each one of us in this room that we are your disciples. We do follow you. Help us, Lord, this very week to live a life that will bring glory to your name, that people would see that we are forgiven by you, a life that's loving and thankful because you are our Savior. Lord, that's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Pray that the Lord give you a wonderful week. Students, teachers, may the Lord bless you as you get back to school and back to work. And as we go throughout this week, let people know that you follow a living Savior. Amen? Amen. Lord bless you. We're dismissed.